How you feeling today? You feeling like you want to take it safe? Or are you feeling a little reckless? Because we're talking about values and busts, those fantasy football picks that are either really comfortable and safe or really going to hurt you. So you're going to take a look at who we think we've got in those positions, and you can leave a comment on who you think. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Tuesday, June 27th. Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway. Back with you. Busts and Values episode of the show today. Very excited to talk a little fantasy football with my friends. It's kind of what we do here. We just have a good time sitting around this table. Yeah. Making ourselves better at fantasy football. Uh, and, and hopefully those that listen as well. <laughs> I would yeah. hope. I would hope. You, you, you made that very specifically about us. Well, no. I'm. They are at the table with us, Mike. Uh, they are the fourth okay. person at this table. Fair enough. I'm excited. It should be fun. We both, uh, or all of us, have picked out some early bust picks. I am very curious to to hear the names that you guys have prepared and then some values, some players going late in drafts that, um, you know, I think we all look at as opportunities to strengthen a roster. And so we'll go through all of those on today's show. Here at the top, I do want to thank everybody that submitted their UDK testimonial videos. We held that Garrett Wilson jersey giveaway uh, over the last couple of weeks. A winner has been selected. I don't know if we have. Do we have, do we have a drum roll? Do we have somewhere? some drum roll or some trumpets? I, I, I see, I, there we go. Come on. <laughs> the the that's, winner. That's what we found? Yeah. That's I, what I got on short notice. Yep. All right. Yeah. So the, the winner of the signed Garrett Wilson jersey. And again, thank you to everybody that submitted. The videos were awesome. Funky Dan. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we couldn't have timed that up any worse. Welcome you, you, to the show. Al, you acted like you were done with the pursuit of buttons. I, I did act that way. Yeah. I could see why you thought that. And you're just like, if I find it, I'm going to slam this button. Even ro- mid, I mid found announcement. It, and I thought I was going to time it up perfect, but we didn't. Yeah, well, you shot your shot. And Funky Dan, <laughs> he was announced during oh the drum gosh. roll portion. Congratulations to Funky Dan uh, from Kentucky. That's a good bit, though. Like to, to, to just to always use the to use the drum roll right when you do the announcement. Congratulations, that's uh, that's pretty sweet. Uh, funky Dan, Funky Dan, congrats! Uh, Twitter at the FF Ballers. If you want to follow the show over there, you can follow Mike at FF Hitman, Jason at Jason FFL, and uh, you can follow me at Andy Holloway. The community, you can find that at jointhefoot.com. And uh, we do have a quick question on today's show. Is this person's name Colonel w- with a K? Is that how you would pronounce this? Like like a popcorn colonel? Like the no, no, no. S- like, a, like a military colonel. Yeah, but but, cur- but has, isn't popcorn colonel spelled with a K? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, but this is K-O-L-O-N-E-L, like colonel. Oh, okay. Which I've never seen that before. What English language, what are we doing? You have a regular... Like a regularly scheduled annoyance with the Eng- English language. Yeah, uh, you, well, like you're, it you're is what it is, you... Mike. I've accepted that it is what it is. Like I can't, I can't do anything. Well, yes, we can. If we can cause enough of an uproar, podcast tirades on a fantasy show. I'm not talking about the just the podcast. I'm talking about the people. We need to stand up and say we will not tolerate. Is this your political platform? C O L. Kerr. Yeah. No, what I, is I, going on? I agree with you. And so this question comes in for Colonel <laughs> in Vancouver. Uh, British well, that's Columbia, like a Canada. Uh, what is, isn't that a colonic? Uh, oh, a colonic. That's, yeah. that's, that'd be a worse name. Bonjour. Um, yeah. Vancouver, British Columbia. 
Uh, Colonel says, excuse my ignorance, guys, but could you please explain to me how the tiers work? It's my second year watching you guys and my first year as a UDK Plus no, member. You. Learned a lot, but do not quite grasp tiers yet. So tiers are extremely important. They, they take linear rankings that make someone think that player X is so much more valuable than player Y when really they're just about the same because they're grouped in the same tier or that player X that's right next to player Y are, are just as good as one another when really there's a tier break in what the upside is, what the expectation is, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how you use them is really a matter of knowing what players are grouped in tiers. It is not – sometimes people think, oh, if there is this – if I'm in tier five at this position and tier four in that position, that I have to take the position that is tier four. That's not how it works. Uh, really, what, it, what it's meant to do is it's meant to give you – uh, a visual glance representation of how many players are left at this position that are about the same value so that you know, oh my gosh, I'm running out of this quality of player. And that position has a lot of the tier that we're in right now, whether that's tier two or tier eight, you just say there's a lot of these players left at that position. There's a few left at this position. Maybe I want to think about going where, uh, you know, that, that, that tier is about to run out. It it really helps cross positionally, where I can look at, at the you know the, the tiers like that bucket of running backs. Say there's there's still four guys left in that tier. I know that I pick again in three picks. That means that I'm going to be guaranteed to get one of those running backs. Meanwhile, the tier or the bucket of wide receiver quality, there's only one or two of those guys left, so I would make the decision, I'm going to take that wide receiver and know that I'm going to get a, a, a running back who's comparable, at least in my rankings and projections, to these other guys. It's, it, it helps you have a better value, for return a better yeah, value for your draft pick. I was going to say, sometimes maybe the word tiers confuses people, but you brought it up with the language of like a bucket. Yeah. It's a grouping of players at a specific value. That's that's the best summary, right? We're, yeah. we're we're putting them together in a group so that you understand whether you have a bunch of them left, so that you can maybe wait at that position, or you need to make a move on that on that specific group. And um, they can be very very useful. Um, tier based drafting is what we have always recommended with the Ultimate Draft Kit. It's why we build them out in that fashion. I mean, there are lots of different ways you can look at player rankings in the Ultimate Draft Kit, including a top two hundred, but that is often produced by demand. People want the top 200. They want, you know, you've got full player projections that that are on there. But tier-based drafting is is our recommended strategy heading into your fantasy football drafts. And so um, hopefully that helps you out. Yep. Uh, we don't have any big news to talk about on today's show other than, you know, the headline here, a couple of, like, fantasy footballers' pieces of news, which is July is Saturday. Mm. Which Saturday means, is July. And Saturday is July. It works both ways. And that is when we begin three shows a week. Oh, man. That means Which that, means the ramp up is here. That means that training camp is uh, we, we can put together the little paper chain mm. and count, count down the days. Till we have to break in with like random injuries and stuff like that. No, that's no. Not, no that's I, not. Let's not bring us down. <sighs> Until we can come in with unnecessary hype about players. Yeah, there we right? go. Yeah. Um. And maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll eventually know where DeAndre Hopkins and Devin Cook and Ezekiel Elliott and uh, some of those players are going. Someday. So, uh, so episodes will be Tuesday and Thursday like they are now, but also a Saturday episode starting this week. We will be off on the 4th of July. We will on, be uh, Americaning. Yeah. We'll be, uh, we'll be celebrating the holiday with our families. So we'll be back with another episode on Thursday, but there'll be a Dynasty episode on Wednesday for the Dynasty podcast. So... Don't worry about it. You yep. got you're gonna have plenty of content, but yeah, three shows a week, rest of July, and then take a breath, boys. Get those smelling salts out. Five shows a week starting in August. Yeah, I'm working out. I'm gonna start getting my pump on, get okay. ready for the season. I'm gonna need that. I'm an uh, old man. You're now. gonna need cardio. Oh, yo, yo, you, oh, you yeah, in on that? That's pickleball. Okay. I came across a uh, in a Twitter account that I had never seen. I shared it with everybody here at work. Yeah. And all it does is shows classic clips of NFL games. Yeah. And I got sucked in. I'm like, 
Oh, you can give him oh. a shout out. Tell him what I, the I, handle. I'll it's vintage, find... vintage NFL. Okay, vintage NFL, something like that. But I just I started watching some clips, and it was, man, I really, <laughs> I really like football, and I'm very excited that football is back. You just watch through vintage yes. clips because you can't yep. watch live ones. Uh huh. And I mean, like they're so old that you just you don't remember everything that happened. Let's see how excited Brooks is about football. Brooks, are you pretty uh, you hyped? Oh yeah! Oh, that's a big that one. Was, that was that was pretty good. Kill! Okay, all right, we're excited. Um, it'll be fun. I mean, we we're kind of in a lull for news right now. Like we haven't had sure. big player signings and um, a lot of big things happening. Other than you know, that's why everybody's paying attention to the maybe Tyreek is under suspicion. Maybe he's not. Maybe he'll be charged. Maybe they can't charge him. Right. Um, so we're kind of staying away from that till we get some some big answers, but. Uh, football's on the way. Let's get into the bus picks. Bus. Eggman is back. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was good. Um, okay, I'm going to let one of you guys go first with your bust selection. Early bust pick for this year. Somebody you are avoiding. All right, I, I will jump in. Uh, my And this one is interesting because... He's still ranked pretty high for me, but I just I don't think that he is worth the the cost of admission. I don't think he's worth the draft ticket. And it is tight end TJ Hawkinson of the Minnesota Vikings. I have him as my tight end four. He is currently going as tight end three over on underdog and on sleeper. And look at, at last year. So his actual pace as a Minnesota Viking, if you take out the final week because he didn't play the full game, it it's okay. It's 111 receptions, which that part is great. If you're in a oh, PPR. Yeah, that's, that's uh, Zach Ertz special. If you're in a PPR league, that seems great, but only 950 yards on those catches and six touchdowns. Like I said, solid for PPR, but I think that he is being propped up because of two spike games, one when he was, when he was on the Lions and one as a Viking, and he really overperformed. F granted, he had a midseason trade. I don't know that we've seen a tight end of his – you know, draft caliber, change teams in the middle of a season, and then go on and and be be useful for fantasy football. And when he got traded, I think all three of us were kind of like, "Well, I don't know if this is news because we just we haven't seen a player make a transition and then have an impact." But here's the deal: even giving you that that projection pace that he was on weeks nine through seventeen, he was under fifty yards in five of nine games. He finished as a top five weekly tight end. Once, so like in wow. a a real impact for your team, one time and like top five is not a huge bar. Now, maybe with the full off season and he gets worked in even more. But here is another piece where I am bearish uh, on T.J. Hawkinson's outlook. In that same time period that I quoted, you know, where weeks nine through seventeen, where he wasn't hitting real spike weeks, he's just kind of consistently putting up points. Adam Thielen, the wide receiver two for the Minnesota Vikings at that time, was averaging about four receptions, 40 yards, and .3 touchdowns per game. That is a pace of 62 for 674 and six touchdowns, 15% of the targets. That is horrific for a wide receiver two on that team. And they made some moves. They, they uh, waived Adam Thielen. They spent their first-round pick on Jordan Addison. So that mark that I gave you, right, 62 for 674, I took a look back because I think I'm going to project Jordan Addison will have a bigger impact for the Minnesota Vikings than 674 yards. And just looking at the actual hard data over the last decade, 41 receivers in the first round, 18 of those wide receivers surpassed that Adam Thielen mark as, and they were more involved, which takes action away from TJ Hawkinson. And then if you look at the first-round wide receivers that didn't hit that mark, there was only two of them that played a full season. And those other 23 guys, they averaged 11 games. I know that it's a lot of numbers. But essentially what I'm saying here, the chance of Jordan Addison beating out what Adam Thielen was doing in that time period is almost a certainty. As long as Jordan Addison is on the field, he is going to beat that out. And whatever Jordan Addison gets, it takes away from TJ Hawkinson. So, again, T.J. Hawkinson's ranked pretty high for me, but to me it's an opportunity cost thing of 
I don't think he's going to be a difference maker at a onesie position and to be drafted in the fourth round or, or, or 50th overall like he is on underdog, this person has to make a difference. And if, if you want to make a difference at a onesie position, guys who are going right around that TJ Hawkinson area, we're talking Joe Burrow, Justin Fields, Justin Herbert, like guys who I project will actually make a big difference at a onesie position. And I'm just, I'm not into what TJ Hawkinson is doing at that draft price. You want a compelling case for a tight end you take in the fourth round to be able to be the one overall or the two overall. Which he was the number two overall, but as Jason has pointed out many times in his, uh, what you're showing your concern for Travis Kelsey's ADP is tight ends just as a group. The, the scoring was very, very subpar. It was very low, and, well, that, had, and Hawkinson just snuck into the tight end, too. Well, yeah, Mark Andrews was injured throughout the year. Darren Waller didn't play football, um, and George Kittle missed time. And Kyle he, Pitts was hurt yeah, for over so, half the year. So my, about, my point is, I, I'm, I'm just saying, I want to have a stronger case for a player drafted in the fourth round at tight end to be in that. I mean, we're all going to have him ranked there. Mm -hmm. And we'd all draft him if he was an eighth round draft pick. Yes. Yep. But it's all about so to to make the point, what a bust represents for us in fantasy here is not that the player can't perform to the standards of our projections. It, you know, you're not predicting that TJ Hawkinson has a statistical disaster of a season. Correct. What you're saying is that that even if he hits these marks to be the tight end four, like we haven't projected, spinning a fourth round draft pick is not going to make as much of an impact on your team as investing that maybe on a player like, look, there's cases for Justin Fields and Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert to be the number one overall quarterback or the number two overall quarterback or other players at different positions in that round. Well, and even He's even, just being propped up so severely. Yeah, I mean, the gap. We, we talked just earlier about the tiers and the buckets of these similar type of players. I don't know that there is a massive difference between Dallas Goddard and TJ Hawkinson or Darren Waller. Dar you know, if Darren Waller ends the season with more targets, yards, and touchdowns than TJ Hawkinson, I'm not shocked. And if that happens, you're getting him in the eighth round versus spending a really high draft capital pick on someone that if you grab Hawkinson in the fourth round, he has to perform in weak winning fashion. And, and Mike, I think it, the most telling stat was that in his time – with the Vikings, even though he accumulated a lot of stats, he did not win you weeks. It, it just what one top five performance. Yes. It, he was the number one. So yeah, like, that was a good like, one. It was it was a good week. T.J. Hawkinson has that in him because he did it twice this past season when he was with the Vikings. It was week sixteen against the Giants, one hundred and nine and two. But I mean, you got to have you have you need more of those. <laughs> well, and then just one. And, and you didn't bring his name up, but KJ Osborne over the last four weeks of the year, he had a 117 yard game, 157 yard game with 16 targets. He put up the same stat line that Thielen did essentially over the course of the year. So you do have the possibility of him, um, you know, based on what they've been talking about in Minnesota. He's 26 years old. Like he he's going to be involved in this offense. It's not all going to be, you know, Addison and no Osborne. Right. So there will be distribution around that offense, and there is some risk there with Hawkinson. So, um, you know, there are times in which we've been bullish about T.J. Hawkinson, or Jason has been a big uh, supporter in previous years because of the value. But right now, he does seem very high. Like, yeah, you have shares expensive. of him in best ball? I have one share of him in best ball. <laughs> Stupid auto draft. <laughs> All right, Jason. Um, yeah, look. Give me, uh, give me your bus. I'm pick. gonna give you my bus pick, and people are not gonna like it. And no. I'm gonna tell you straight up, I don't like it. I hate bringing this up. This is a player who's extremely talented. He is super young. He is super athletic. He is everything that I target in fantasy football, and I am not targeting him specifically. I'm talking about last year's rookie sensation, Kenneth Walker the third, running back for the Seattle Seahawks. He was awesome last year when thrust into the starting role with Rashad Penny injured. He was talented in college. He was talented in the NFL field, and we know he can get the job done. And if at the end of this year he ends up being a bell cow and being awesome, I'm certainly not going to I'm not going to be uh, you know surprised because he obviously can do that. In fact, um, our early running back rankings show that we did on the fantasy footballers for this coming season, we had him – as our running back six, that is the level of upside that we see in the talent of this player. 
The problem is right now he's being drafted as a top 15 running back. And in the second round, Pete Carroll had to ruin our nice fun things and draft Charbonnet. Zach Charbonnet out of UCLA, a, I believe, a sensational uh, running back, a very, uh, <laughs> very multifaceted, talented, big bodied, pass catching, pile moving back. P and super positive reports out of uh, OTAs. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a good, pl both these guys are good players. And this is good for the Seahawks. I think that those two guys are going to be incredible one two punch because Kenneth Walker last year. He had a ton of big plays. I mean, he, you know, his he had 17 runs of 15 plus yards last year, and that's really where all of his fantasy juice came from. Were those uh, those big plays? Because on a play by play basis, he was actually pretty negative. He, he, you know, he wasn't always a positive gainer. It's kind of like Saquon, where it's like you deal with a yeah, bad yeah, play, yeah. bad play, bad play in order to get a 25 yard, uh, you know, big uh, moving play. The the issue I have is that where fantasy points are scored are usually in the red zone, in the you know scoring touchdowns, and in the passing game, getting those PPR those half PPR points. They are those two plays are worth so much more than just a handoff that goes for yardage and yardage alone, and that's my fear for Kenneth Walker because Zach Charbonnet is a big bodied back who can move a pile. Big when they be. And when they get down by the goal line, I mean, last year, Kenneth Walker was the only player in the NFL to receive all of their team's carries inside the five-yard line, and he converted that into only two touchdowns. That's not necessarily his specialty, and I could see them saying, hey, let's get the big body back. Let's yeah. get the BBB in here and have him inside the five-yard line. So if you take some touchdowns away from Kenneth Walker, <laughs> that's – that's really bad. And then Zach Charbonnet is a really good pass catcher. So if now Kenneth Walker's not involved in the passing game and he's not involved in the red zone, I think you're going to have big plays. Kenneth Walker's too good. Like, he'll have games where he's awesome because he rips off a 55-yard touchdown run. 55! Thank you. Um, the, the issue is, will it be consistent? What happens in the games where he doesn't have a big touchdown run from outside of the red zone? Will will he end up with eight fantasy points? Probably not. I mean, it, you know, this is if he's if he's splitting time, not catching the ball, and doesn't score a touchdown. I think you're going to have a lot of games where you're going. He's got seventy yards on the ground. He was efficient. He had a good game, and that's seven fantasy points if he didn't catch the ball and he didn't score touchdowns. And so right well, now I, to be drafted in the top fifteen, I've got him at running back twenty two in my personal rankings. I just think he's he's a little. It's a little scary to me. He played 15 games last year and was the running back 16 in terms of fantasy finish. And he didn't get a lot of opportunities in those first few weeks. You can kind of throw those out. And he was he was electric. He was great. This is one of those situations where you brought up some of these points earlier in the offseason. And unfortunately, they persuaded me to lower him in my rankings. I wanted to really dig in because when talent is there and you see it on the football field, like there was a part of this past offseason where I'm like, is he the you know, pre-draft, is he the best target at running back in dynasty leagues? Like he should, should he actually be considered number one mm -hmm. because of just the talent that he possesses? Because you went into this season saying he's going to be just the guy. But if Charbonnet's strengths are the things that are strong for fantasy, it is a, it's a scarier proposition to rank him that high. Is there a possibility he's a steal? I think so. But that'll come more down to, you know, are they happy with Charbonnet on third down? Does he do what we think he can do on third down? Will he pass protect? Yeah, I mean, I, I will I will say, Mike, you've brought this up in uh, favor of Kenneth Walker, and this is good information to keep in mind if you, you know, look, if you want to just bet on Kenneth Walker's talent, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, back in the day, there was, um, when, when they drafted Rashad Penny, and they spent yeah, the first a round. first rounder, you had Chris Carson as the incumbent, and before Penny got injured, when Penny was a rookie, it was the Chris Carson show. They did not use Rashad Penny very much uh, through those, you know, first ten weeks or so. They were they were using Chris Carson as the bell cow. So who knows what happens last year? Yeah, that if is Rashad if, Penny, if Penny didn't get hurt. hurt yeah. I mean, you've got both cases where where they stuck with Carson because health was there, and then you have Penny went down and Kenneth Walker. I mean, we were here last off season. Yeah, and this was not a backfield we wanted to mess around with because you knew. 
you know, Rashad Penny was injury prone and Kenneth Walker's a rookie and we had just seen the rookie not get an opportunity. So, you know, part of it to me is also Kenneth Walker got hurt twice last year. He went into the season hurt. He got hurt in the end part of the year. They've been dealing with injuries. We saw Dallas or uh, DJ Dallas and um, who's Travis Homer. Homer. And I mean, players that don't get, shouldn't have had that many snaps. And so that makes it a little bit nerve wracking. And it, it just, I haven't had the fortitude to stick to my guns because I believe what you're saying. So he's he's interesting as that. I think we've laid out a good case here of of he, he could go either way, and so it'll be up to the you know just drafters' choice of do you believe in Walker? You could be heavily rewarded or you could be heavily penalized. I think Jace is just saying that the way that he's looking at that situation, he's going to choose to to let someone else either get the glory or uh, hold the bag. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably be drafting more Charbonnet than I will be Kenneth Walker because I think both guys are talented, so give me the one with the opportunity for fancy points. Quick break, and then we'll be back with my bus pick. All right, I am going to go with a quarterback as my early bust pick here, and um, – I guess I'm a little bit uh, – I, I root for this guy, but I, I do wonder if we may be moving to a different stage of his career. And it's Dak Prescott. Boo. Boo. Mike doesn't like yes. it because he has Dak ranked at number seven. He's being drafted as the quarterback nine right now in uh, in sleeper. And Jason and I have him at 12. And he's turning 30 this offseason. The biggest red flags to me on Dak are connected to the things that kind of made him impervious in fantasy in previous years. One of them being he just doesn't run the football the way that he used to run it. First three years, he had six touchdowns every year. The last four years, it's been three, three, one, one. He averages 13 yards per game rushing the football. Those were some kind of cheat codes to keep him in the top six, top seven. He's had some catastrophic catastrophic yeah. injuries that have led to that. Um, I look at his 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 career uh, stats right now, and you see the pass attempts per game have gone down three consecutive years for Dak. There was a time when this defense wasn't very good, and the offense was very, very good when Amari Cooper was there and Dak was throwing the ball all, all over the field. So the attempts per game are coming down. You have a change in offensive coordinators. All of the enthusiasm you guys have shared repeatedly about Kellen Moore going to the Los Angeles, his depart if his presence in LA means something, then his departure in Dallas means something. Regardless of whether you're happy or sad with Brian Schottenheimer. And Mike McCarthy's come out and said, look, we run want to run the football more. Well, why do you want to run the football more? Here, here's why. Because he had a career high fifteen interceptions last year, and he did it in only twelve games. And he put two more into the opposing team's hand in the playoffs. Yeah, it's not great. Along with some fumbles, he had nineteen turnovers in thirteen games. Yeah, it was pretty bad, and a lot of those were like f you watch film and you go, "What the crap was that? <laughs> Just <laughs> <laughs> terrible." Exactly, and and when you have a defense that is as exquisite as Dallas's defense, turnovers like that, they just they destroy your team because you believe you can win the game with very little, with some efficiency on offense. And so, you know, we're not we're not in the days of the number one ranked uh, offensive line. I mean, it's fluctuated a little bit uh, over the past handful of years. You don't have Zeke there, and I know that Zeke was on his way out, but what happens if something happens to Tony Pollard? Are you, do you have something in the running game to threaten Defenses, don't say Ronald Jones's name. I was going to say it. You were going to say his name. <laughs> just, just because it's funny to say. I mean, j just think about Dallas's offense. If you take efficient running game of Tony Pollard out of it and you put it all on Dak, your play action pass game, which is something that, you know, they've been able to take advantage of. Like, I think Dak finishes at 12. The problem is, is that's like, you know, that's not what I draft in fantasy football is a player to end up at 12. That's like late career Matt Ryan. That's like late career Phillip Rivers throwing all of those interceptions. So there's a lot of red flags to me with Dak's game. And like, I won't be shocked if next offseason we're talking about him the way. I mean, I hope it doesn't happen. But if we're talking about him in the way that we talk about Russell Wilson right now. Mm. Which yeah, would not make a lot not of people nice happy. I know. 
I don't think Dak's personality would allow us yeah. to treat him that yeah, Dak, way. Uh, Dak is Dak's a good, young, Dak's good younger. human. But year 33 Russell Wilson, we saw the wheels fall off in perf in performance. Yeah, I'm just saying we're not going to talk about him the same way. You're saying because we, we, we have more of an active uh, dislike? Yeah, remember the danger witch? <laughs> so I don't I don't think Dak's doing that. Dak's a cool guy. Dak's a great guy. Yeah. And I'm I look, I want I think he can be very successful for the football team. But I don't think the things that he needs to do to get there are going to help your fantasy team. Like, they could be a 13, 14-win team again. But Dak could also do that with efficient one to two touchdown a game. You're probably not getting it on the ground, and that's not going to get it done for fantasy. So I think, you know, even though he's going in the eighth round, when you're making a decision on a quarterback again, just like the TJ Hawkinson argument, I want to have a case in my mind as to why this player is going to have an exceptional season. Now, Mike, you've held your tongue. Because I think you have him ranked where you do because you, you recognize – Brandon Cooks represents something to the offense. Yep. Michael Gallup represents something to the offense, being healthier. Now, he does lose his safety net, which, look, is uh, has been very important to him with Dalton Schultz being gone. So I'm concerned there, too. Uh, it, yeah, I, I totally get that. That but, that saves him from a lot of interceptions. But it also is like, I think they just need someone who is capable. I mean, before Dalton Schultz, you know, it was, it was Jason Witten at the very end of his his career uh you know I, I had hoped it was gonna be Blake Jarwin but then it was it was Dalton Schultz and like More like fake Jarwin hey oh got it uh when when uh when Dalton Schultz broke out I mean, it was oh well how's that gonna do he's now he has this Dalton Schultz guy like, you talk oh, no, about can... Dalton Schultz like he's an insurance salesman that lives next door I think is that Dalton, what you think of him? I think Dalton Schultz is a fine football player. I don't think he is a difference maker. So if you have like if Jake Ferguson is, I think he'll be just fine. Or if it's the Schoonman, I think he'll be Schoonman. They'll be just fine no matter uh it, no matter what happens because they're just they're just running seams just a, up the just field. Just a utility guy, huh? Yes. Poor Dalton. But, All right, um, let's move on. Values. All right, I think, uh, you, you know, the UDK, we, we have a bunch of consensus picks, sleepers, breakouts, busts, values, players that we, we put into those categories that uh, you can target or stay away from. To me, values are my favorite. Mm. Uh, we, we talked about on the sleeper show that, like, you can't hide anymore. And so I think that world of um, completely out of nowhere names is is kind of gone. It's more like... Uh, kind of a value argument in the sleeper category at times. We try to go really deep, you know, Jalen Warren and those guys. But the value picks to me, it's like there are categories of them. There are sometimes there's older players that like their age, like they just can't get moved up in ADP. Like I think Keenan Allen's in that category this year where it's like, yeah. like the laws of physics don't allow him to get past the fourth round. Like that's, not allowed because of the age, and we saw that with Frank Gore years ago, and uh, probably Adam Thielen two years ago was that way. And sure, and so that's like a category of value. And then there are players that emerge into new roles, and we just don't know what they're going to do, so they're an unknown value. But Jason, are you going to go first here, or was it Mike? The order was Mike. I am okay. happy to go first. Mike, Mike might as well go first because because I'm on my own over here. You're, you're kind of on your own rankings wise. Yes, I have this player ranked uh, much higher than everybody else. Uh you guys have him ranked below ADP and it feels bad. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. Oh, it Jason, feels, like, feels fine. No, but Jason is it's, it's kind of a Jason's my a brand. lifelong truther. Yeah. Of Rashad Penny running back now for the Philadelphia Eagles as Jason makes a note. Yeah, got to gotta move him gotta up. Got to move Rashad Penny up. And here is my case for Rashad Penny being a value. On the field, Rashad Penny is, as Tony the Tiger would say, great. He is great. Over his past 16 games played, he is averaging over six yards per carry. For his career, it is 5.6. Since the year 2000, only six times have we ever seen a running back with 100-plus carries Average over six yards per carry. Adrian Peterson, Jamal Charles, C.J. Spiller's magic year, Dobbins, 
his rookie year, Alvin Kamara and Rashad Penny. Health is the entirety of the conversation for Rashad Penny. Uh, and last year, right, Miles Sanders was their guy. He, he, was, he was their bell cow running back. Going into last year, Miles Sanders had his own health concerns. The two previous seasons, he had appeared in only 12 games. That's it. Back-to-back -back years, 12 games for Miles Sanders, and that did not stop Philadelphia from giving him 70% of the running back attempts, the 11th highest mark at the running back position. Miles only saw 26 targets. Like Rashad Penny, pass catching, just it hasn't been in the profile as a professional. But Miles only saw 26 targets. And yes, the targets, they keep the ceiling higher and they keep your floor higher as well. Miles was pretty hot and cold. But at the end of the year, it was still over 1,200, 1200 rushing yards, 11 rushing touchdowns, and he finished as the running back 13. So for a ninth round pick, the potential of seeing 200 plus carries, which I think Rashad Penny can hit that, and double digit targets, it's, it's super alluring, alluring. And yes, you have the DeAndre Swift into the mix. To me, DeAndre Swift is more of the Philadelphia Eagles just taking a chance to see if anything is there. And Swift, to me, profiles more as uh, a threat to to Boston Scott or Kenneth Gainwell of, of that type of a role. I think that should the team move forward with everybody who's on the, on the team, I think that Rashad Penny should be the heavy favorite to be the, the two-down grinder, and which on the Philadelphia Eagles, that's a lot of touchdown upside in the, on a very high-powered offense. I'm not willing to uh, move him until I get into camp. And that's fair. Because I think that this team likes Kenneth Gainwell. I, I believe that there's a there was a loyalty to Rashad Penny in Seattle that we don't we haven't witnessed yet in uh Philadelphia. It was certainly a flyer by them, right? I mean this that I believe that the flyer they took on Rashad Penny is similar to the one that they took on DeAndre Swift. Mm -hmm. Right? This is not a long term deal. Finger fracture, knee sprain, hamstring, ACL preseason knee, calf strain, hamstring strain, groin strain, tibia fracture. Oh, yes. The, the that is, um, the that's the last four years for Rashad Penny. So um, I, I, I take some issue with the thought that I don't injuries... get where you're, what's your point. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I mean, it's all lower body. His hands have been, oh, no, finger fracture. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but the, I take a little issue with the idea that injury is the only thing because I don't know where this team is going to lay things out. I'm more than willing to move him. If we see camp and it's like, okay, he's he's taking all the reps, like this is a camp battle I want to watch because, you know, some of these uh, backfield committee battles are on teams that I don't care who wins it, sort of. Philly's a team I kind of care about. You mentioned the Miles Sanders numbers last year. So if, yeah, and, and, and uh, Kyle's pointing out that Kenneth Gainwell was really good in the playoffs, and it's true. Like, um, uh, I, I think that that's a possibility that Kenneth Gainwell gets more play. So, um, you know, the numbers that Penny's put up when he's played and gotten dedicated opportunities have been outrageous. That's all I meant with... But he clearly is overextending his body. He's running too hard. Why go six fast. a carry when you yeah. could go five and maybe stay healthy? I'm saying health is the only conversation to me of... uh, of, Like, Rashad Penny is a great player. It's not like, yeah. well, you know, he's been okay here. No, he's... When he's on the field, he is incredible. But, I mean, granted... It's been very well, limited about, when we've seen him on the field. Think about the range of outcomes in a dynasty league on Rashad Penny right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because there's there's every chance that if an injury happens or he's just not the guy, you're done. That's it. Rashad Penny's career is not going to reemerge after this season if he doesn't produce in Philadelphia. Right. Or if he gets injured again. It's over. Yeah. Like, it's just – you you could just slide him off the roster. I mean, he's not going to get – if he gets signed, he's going to get signed in some capacity that it's like – it's Trey Sermon's career now. Or it could be the dude who's with four, ironically on the same yeah, team. With fourteen hundred yards and ten rushing touchdowns and get a get a contract somewhere. Because he has he has been great. And I, I would agree with Mike that if And DeAndre look, Swift is going four rounds ahead of Rashad Penny. Yeah. I, I would much rather take the shot on Rashad Penny. Um if all of the backs in Philadelphia are healthy, I think Rashad Penny is the best one. Yeah. And that's and that's what my argument comes down to is, uh, like the, yeah, the the contract in Rashad Penny is not it's not a big investment. The, so for both Swift and Penny, the team is not really in. But you could, I mean, kind of for the rest of the team as well. Even though you know Gainwell has 
more team equity. Like they like the guy. He's been on the team for a few years. But just there's there's no real contracts that you can look at and go that guy's going to for sure get it because he's getting well, the, the millions of dollars. It's one of the reasons, like right now, I have it projected for them all to get it, which means that none of them get it in the way that matters to me because Jalen Hurts is going to score 14 times or 10 times or 12 times around the goal line, and the other guys will be, you know, there's four. Boston Scott's still a part of this offense. Sure, he still got red zone carry. So Camp though could really move that around for me. And Penny is certainly very, very talented. So, Jason, bring up uh, uh, this name. Oh, it's a guy. A I year just, late. Yeah, a year, a year late. Or two actually, years late. Actually, two years uh, late. right on cue with this guy last year on this show. <laughs> he was my bust pick this show last year. Deontay Johnson, wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> that's, that's really excellent. Okay. Excellent work over right. there. Yeah, that's yeah. a good bit. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, there's the now big we got it. So oh boy! You, like you have to like raise the volume of your voice to try and yes. talk over the drum roll. Perfect. Wow. Well done. Um. Yeah. Deontay Johnson is, uh, I think, a great value this season. Last year, I thought he was a bust. He was going. Well, he was a bust. In, you it, thought it, and he was. Yeah. He, he was going way too high for a rookie quarterback to come in and to be able to support. You know, he was like a third, fourth round pick last year. People love Deontay Johnson. 70% uh, of rookie quarterbacks fail to support a top 36 wide receiver. And last year, Deontay Johnson finished as the wide receiver 39. He did that. He just needed one touchdown. Yeah. And he would have been top 36. He would have, but he couldn't because Kenny Pickett didn't know how to throw touchdowns yet. Thankfully, nobody taught him. Coming into year two, here's what I know for a fact, an absolute ironclad fact. He will not throw a worse touchdown rate. Kenny Pickett will not. There is can't no throw any rates. He, you, uh, you can't throw as few a touchdowns per passing attempt as he did last year. He won't be allowed to play football if that happens. Um, and, and historically, sophomore quarterbacks take a big step up in that specific category. Touchdown throwing is something that is not easy for rookies coming into the NFL. You saw it with Trevor Lawrence, just abysmal touchdown rate his rookie season. His sophomore year, he's throwing league average touchdown rate. So I don't think Kenny Pickett is a star. He's not Trevor Lawrence, but he will throw a much better touchdown rate. If he gets even near league average, you're talking about success for Deontay Johnson. Deontay Johnson had 147 targets this last year. He earns targets. He is a great route runner. He is one of only eight wide receivers in the NFL to hit a 23% target share each of the last three seasons. And that list, it's they're good. Your Cooper Cup, Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, A.J. Brown, Stephon Diggs, Debo Samuel, Keenan Allen, and... Deontay Johnson. So you know he's going to get the targets. Yeah, 140 plus, three straight years. Touchdown variance is massive. We talk about touchdowns not being a sticky stat, and it really isn't. You look two years ago, Jacoby Myers was Deontay Johnson. Jacoby Myers had so many targets. It was like 124 targets, had almost no touchdowns. Well, he's not a touchdown scoring guy. Well, no, that's not true. He's an NFL wide receiver, and last year in only 14 games, he had six touchdowns with Mac Jones coming into, uh, you know, not his rookie season. That's what's going to happen for Deontay Johnson. So to me, I think his baseline, I mean, we saw it, right? Last year is wide receiver 39 with a rookie quarterback. And he's being drafted as the wide receiver 34. So he's being drafted around what his baseline is. If he got six touchdowns like Jacoby Myers did in, uh, which I think is reasonable, he did that in 14 games, you're talking about a top 20 wide receiver. He would He would have been ahead of a lot of names that we really like, you know, ahead of DJ Moore. He would have been ahead of Chris Godwin last year if the touchdowns came. So the way that I view him as a value is, look, if you're in a PPR league, half PPR, he's a really safe pick. Because of where he's being drafted, you're basically getting his floor. You're drafting a player at his floor, and he's not going to score zero touchdowns. That just doesn't happen it was an NFL record he set this year you don't just do that back-to-back -back years and if you remember last year there were there were those crazy plays just like with Jacoby Myers the year prior where it was like it's gonna happen he's on his way to the end zone and then right at the one yard line it doesn't happen so to me it's just a matter of you're in a better situation Chase Claypool is now gone uh, you, you, he, his targets are assured his quarterback will be better the offensive line is improved He's good if the touchdowns come. It's just a great value. 
it's pretty difficult to find 8.6 targets a game in the seventh round. Exactly. And so, you know, when you think about situations for your fantasy team, maybe in the seventh round, this is a player you'd start if you're drafting in a three wide receiver league. If it's a two wide receiver league, this is a luxury for your bench where bye weeks, opportunities, injuries, you get to put 8.6 targets a game onto your team. I mean, that is, um, that's a luxury, right? You, you, it's it, a value. I mean, <laughs> okay. All right. It's a well value. Done. Well Thank done. you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, because the other option is a lot of these other players going in that range are going to be boom or bust. They're going to be very, um, you know, deep threats, minimal targets. Do they, you know, at Donovan Peoples-Jones or something where, you know, the target share for Deontay Johnson is going to be huge. Yeah, he's a, he's a fourth-year wide receiver going into his fifth year in the prime of his career, 27 years old. And if he gets eight targets a game, he, over the last decade, there's been 12 wide receivers that average eight targets a game in year four and year five. Every single one of them, top 20 wide receiver in year five. The hardest part for me last year was that it's what you already know, but Deontay's a great player. This was the number nine overall fantasy finisher of the year before. He had over 100 receptions. He was, um, and I think we got kind of blinded by, or I got blinded by, look, Big Ben wasn't good, but he was really good for Deontay. And so uh, Kenny Pickett couldn't do it. Couldn't get him eight touchdowns, seven touchdowns, five touchdowns. One like touchdown. Previous three years. One <laughs> touchdown. Couldn't even get him one. All right. The name I'm going to bring up is my value pick as a player I wanted to talk about. Um, Samaje Pirine, running back for the Denver Broncos. Uh, this is almost a 10th round draft pick. Um, very, very into the ninth round right now on sleeper. Uh, that puts his ADP as the running back 39, which means that both of you guys, even though you have him ranked below me, are still above ADP. Jason at 36, Mike at 26. Yeah, I'm in. Um, I am taking the leap. I have him at 21. For some, and you say, Samaj P. Ryan, this was a player that we pretty much bemoaned every opportunity he ever had in Cincinnati because it represented not Mixon. And in the fantasy world, Mixon had the draft capital and was on every roster, and Samaj P. Ryan just represented a snap goblin. Except for he was good. Yeah. And we really were frustrated by the fact he ended up on third down all of the time. But what Samaj P. Ryan is known for is strength in passing situations. That's why they did it. He has a lifetime uh, catch percentage of 85.6%. And he was brought into Denver with a purpose by a brand new head coach in Sean Payton that has a history of utilizing running backs well, especially in passing situations. He had 46 receptions last year. Do you guys realize that? I did not. I do now. <laughs> 46 in Cincinnati last season since he kept using him on third down. And that is, you just brought it up with Charbonnet, that is a very valuable down for fantasy football. We do not know where... Javante Williams' health truly is. And that will play a factor. But I think Samaj P. Ryan is being massively, massively overlooked. And I brought it up in the context of Alexander Madison, where it's like the career numbers for Alexander Madison on a yards per carry basis are not as good as what Samaj P. Ryan's are. And I'm not saying that Madison shouldn't be ranked higher than P. Ryan. If you like Madison and you like that opportunity, go for it. But Samaj P. Ryan, the gap between them is insanity to me. Because if we go into the season under Sean Payton in this offense where we saw Latavius Murray have value last year and other relative bums in this backfield, Samaj Piran is going to have every opportunity to be a high-value guy. And Sean Payton's come out and talked about him. You know, his quote, and I, this is quoting Sean Payton, if you watch Piran, you study the tape, you see him on early downs, you see him play third down, he's a great receiver. Obviously, he could block the blitz. He's big, he's physical, he's smart, he's tough, he's built to last. So I think <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was in my head. Duralast in everybody's head. If you were listening to this, he's built to last. Yeah. Duralast. I mean, they've done. They did some good work they, there. Yeah, it's good branding work yeah, for sure. So I, and they've made investments on the offensive line. So I think that you know when you talk about putting Russell Wilson in a position to succeed, it's going to come through the bread and butter of what Sean Payton has done well over the years. And and we're going to know more in camp. Like this is another situation you've got to watch. I'm sure that. Um, Jason won't have him at 36 if we find out Javante Williams is missing four games to start the year or something like that. 
but maybe I'm wrong. I don't want no, to speak that, for that's, you. No, that's probably right. I've got him at 32 and 36, respectively, Javante, slightly ahead of Samaje. But you're right. I mean, if you knew that he, that Javante was starting on the pup, then obviously th those numbers would change. And I would say that one of the best bets over the last several years in fantasy football for draft season is bet against the guys that are injured and and in so doing – yeah, the guys that are going to get the opportunity are great bets. So th this is and probably I, a value. I just want people to understand, like weeks 11, 12, 13, yes. and 14 last year, Samaj P. Ryan was the running back 2, 10, 7, and 22. He's he also, good. He also outsnapped Joe Mixon 43 to 23 in the AFC Championship game against Kansas City. There is a lot of confidence in Samaj P. Ryan among the coaching circles that is clear. And I think we just disliked him because we put him in a category of that's just a backup. That's all he'll ever be. That's to be frank. That's what I've done with Alexander Madison. Makes it harder to get on board. Now I could be proven wrong, and I could be proven wrong here by some AJP Ryan. But I don't think Javante Williams is ready to take a, a decent workload. And I think even when he's ready to come back, if you give third down to some AJP Ryan and and some other opportunities, he'll be fine. Well, it Sean Payton has historically used multiple running backs like when Camaro was doing his damage Mark Ingram was there and Mark mm -hmm. Ingram was also a, and he was the main guy good. in terms of carries yeah the, I mean the to me you know the the difference here of Samaj P Ryan's ADP versus Madison's is if if Javante is healthy Javante is the, the starting running back he is the 1A or just the overall number one. So that's that's the that's the difference here between those two players is Madison is set up to be the starter. And but this is I mean this is fantastic news for like I've been celebrating for Duralast. For I've been ce celebrating that Alexander Madison is finally getting his opportunity. Samaj so P Ryan was like that guy for me. I, mm -hmm. I I would when it was draft season, it's like this guy's really really good and then he unfortunately got drafted to a Washington team that had no idea what they were doing back then, and he just kind of the, the beginning of his career ended up getting wasted. Goes to the Cincinnati, kind of recovers his value, and and I think he has a did you know he had a lost opportunity. a lost year in Miami too. It really seemed I like did he, not even remember that he had a lost year in Miami where he had a total of five opportunities in seven weeks. Really seemed like you were saying he had a bad drinking problem. <laughs> Wait, wait, he said that? He wasted? Yeah, he's like, oh, no. he goes there, he gets no. wasted. No, the, drink, oh. the drinking oh, that, problem yeah. was, was Washington Yeah, but this and was their a, management. Yeah, uh, and this has been tweeted by our main account, but in 13 of 16 season, Sean Payton's Saints offense has finished with top finished top five in total running back fantasy points, 13 yes. of 16 years. Yeah, Sean Payton in running backs is fantasy gold. So, yeah, it'll be, you know, it, it is a, a bit of a, I don't know, a later career prime for Samaj P. Ryan that we might be seeing here soon, but he's he's established himself as a value and um forty six receptions last year is is wild. So uh yeah, for for both of these, like P. Ryan and Rashad Penny, it's trying to get out in front of it. Like if if you are drafting right now, you know, we don't have all the information. So this this is how we are projecting these players. Once camp news comes out and they're saying, oh man, Javante is not on the field. P. Ryan's ADP is going to go up. It was the same for if the Eagles camp. Rashad Penny's out there getting all the first team work. His ADP is going to skyrocket. So we're kind of bringing these guys up right now. So if, if you are drafting right now, I think that – and I like P. Ryan. Now, both of these running backs to me are worth the, the, the late round gamble investment. All right, that is going to do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Reminder, check out the Ultimate Draft Kit – the Draft Analyzer launches on Saturday for the UDK Plus, so another big feature hitting the UDK. You can find out about everything that's included in the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. It will be the number one tool you can rely on to prepare for your fantasy drafts and give you an advantage over your league mates. Thank you once again for joining us. We'll be back with another episode on Thursday. Until then, stay safe, everybody, and we'll, we'll see you then. Goodbye. Built to last. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com.
and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. <laughs>